hotel scene in Boston is booming with a dazzlement of new boutique properties opening their doors, but none can match the colorful history and long record of the Liberty Hotel. You see, for most of its history, folks did everything they could to stay out of this place, even though it was completely free. The Liberty opened in 2007 after a five-year, $150 million makeover. The centerpiece of this National Historic Landmark, its dramatic lobby. Isn't it cool? Adam Butner Burroughs, Director of Operations at the hotel. It's really amazing to walk into this space every day, knowing the history, seeing the beauty of the transformation here. It's a unique space, you won't see it anywhere else. The Liberty Hotel features a couple of cocktail bars and two fine dining restaurants, Clink and Lydia Shire's Scampo, by most accounts a step up from the site's former culinary offerings. The Liberty's 298 guest rooms have been tastefully upgraded with subtle nods to the hotel's past. And special attention has been given to improvements in housekeeping. The hotel's location at the foot of Beacon Hill makes for sweeping views of the Charles River and the city. And as a concession to customer preference, the rooms today feature locks on the inside. We'll leave you to crack this case of a mystery makeover. For now, it's time to break out and head straight to the state line and Flowerbrook Pottery in Dorset, Vermont. This serves as my working studio and my showroom. For Jano Gay, working with clay is a meditative process. Physicality, getting my mitts in the mud, yes. <laughs> <laughs> her shop, an adorable little box of light. That's what spoke to me right away was just the light. Being an artist, you just need that A for mood and it inspires you, but also just, you know, it's uplifting. It wasn't until after she moved in that Jana learned her shop was once a chapel, moved from a town in Massachusetts that no longer appears on any map, rescued by one Charles A. Wade. He was a visionary. Now, moving a chapel over 100 miles in the 1930s was no small task, but Dorset's Charlie Wade was a big thinker. Yeah, exactly. He, entrepreneur of the first water, he really was. Had a cigar jammed in his face most of the time. In fact, Wade moved 30 buildings from what would soon become legendary lost towns. Eight of those structures have found renewed life here in Dorset. Terry Tyler, 92 years old, remembers the man himself. Oh yeah, he drove me on my first date. I wasn't old enough to have a license. We meet up with Tyler and John Matthewson at the Dorset Historical Society. Are you trying to photograph me? <laughs> Tyler agrees to take us on a short tour of the homes, though it takes a bit for him to get the hang of a television interview. Well, how the hell are you going to photograph the building through me? First up, the field house, which these days is, hint, hint, high and dry. I was here when they were building it, and I was only eight years old then. Originally, the home didn't feature columns, a late addition considered controversial by some. He was an architect and he thought it was a grand place, so he put the <coughs> columns on it. Excuse me. Well, at least I cleaned it up some. Alterations and additions have been made to most of the transplanted Dorset homes, but a little schoolhouse that Charlie Wade moved into town has remained unchanged to this day, though its use shifted from the educational to the recreational. When we were youngsters, we played in there and had parties up here, some with liquid refreshments, not with parental approval. 